The moon, more than any other object in the sky, makes us aware of the immense size of the universe. And such an image is therefore quite appropriate to introduce a lecture series of modern physics. A blood moon, as shown here, occurs when the moon is during a lunar eclipse behind the earth and the light from the sun can only reach it after scattering through the earth atmosphere in order to then be reflected towards us on the planet. Looking at the moon and comparing the action of the gravitational force on the moon as it also acts on a falling apple, Isaac Newton for the first time proposed the universality of the laws of physics. His work led then to the establishment of what we now call classical physics. As he said, he stood on the shoulders of others, namely Galileo Galilei and other predecessors who, uh, whose work he combined in his mechanics and uh, followed on from there was the great success of classical physics with uh, thermodynamics and electrodynamics. This all changed in 1900 with Planck's discovery of the radiation formula and then also in 1905 the so-called Annus Mirabilis of Albert Einstein where he uh, proposed four very important ingredients of modern physics. So 1900, 1905, the turn of that century really brought a breakthrough in our physical thought and that's why we call this modern physics. This lecture series is about modern physics and uh, it tries to relate our understanding of modern physics to our understanding of the world of the cosmology of the origin of the world since the Big Bang event. I want to illustrate that the same physics that explains the microscopic world and is now so important to us in technology, for example in light emitting diodes, in uh, smart devices, in tablet computers, the same sort of physics that applies there, namely quantum physics, particle physics, atomic physics, solid state physics, that physics also controls the origin and the history of our cosmos. Two thousand five hundred years ago, Genesis was written, and it's quite interesting to read what it says there because it bears a relationship to our modern understanding of the cosmos. In the English translation it reads, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. I find this quite interesting because several of the concepts which we now employ to describe our modern cosmology are touched upon here. Genesis talks about a beginning of the world. This was thought quite differently in the 1950s where a steady state model of the universe was proposed without a fixed beginning, without a fixed end. Our modern understanding is different. It sees the origin of space and time in the Big Bang. A space-time continuum was created out of a singularity that is very similar to what's proposed here. Physics doesn't discuss what caused this initiation. Um, that's outside science. However, it's clear that um, there, from the evidence that we have that there was a beginning of time and that is very similar to what is discussed here in Genesis. Let us look at this first passage of Genesis in a little bit more detail. I quote, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Well, that's clearly a reference to what we now call the universe. Then it says, quote, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, 
Well, modern cosmology talks about an age of darkness, which was followed by the decoupling of light. That is very similar. The face of the deep. Deep might be interpreted as another word for space or the dimension, the extent of the universe. The extent of the universe and the fact that that extent, that space is expanding, in fact, as we now understand, in an accelerating fashion, that is very important to modern cosmology. It says also, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, a reference to water. Now, one has to apply a little bit of liberty here, but water, H2O, contains two of the most common elements in the universe, namely hydrogen and oxygen. In fact, we know now that 73% of the baryonic mass is hydrogen atoms. A further 25% is helium atoms, and the third largest component is made of oxygen atoms. The last 1% then contains all the other elements of the periodic table. In Genesis, the universe comes out of the Spirit of God. Such a cause or such an initiation is not given by modern cosmology. This is not discussed in physics. It simply happens. There is a lot of energy in a singularity and that singularity occurs in space-time and since then space-time has been expanding. That is the physics view. Discussing beyond that would mean leaving science and uh, entering philosophy or religion. It is interesting to note that both Genesis and modern cosmology consider that time and space were created simultaneously. For religion, causality is not a particular problem since God can fill that void. However, without the existence of time, of course, uh, an A comes before B, comes before C is not possible. So therefore, a discussion of the causality of the origin of the singularity, the Big Bang, is not possible within physics. And that's the reason why it is not even attempted. Now, finally, it's quite remarkable that there is a reference in Genesis to light. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. In our modern understanding of the cosmos, the appearance of light and the almost uniform distribution of light, of electromagnetic radiation throughout the universe, is one of the most important pieces of evidence for the Big Bang. And it is one of the four pillars of the Big Bang theory. The content of light in the universe is quantified using Planck's radiation law, as shown on this slide at the bottom. Intensity of the electromagnetic radiation is plotted there as a function of wavelength lambda. This curve and the associated temperature of 2.7 Kelvin was first discovered by Penzias and Wilson in the 1960s. The fact that the content of electromagnetic radiation in the universe is essentially a black body spectrum that is almost uniform is quite remarkable. The observation of this black body spectrum is now carried out by satellites and is therefore a direct connection of our modern times to the Big Bang which is the origin of the world and therefore also our origin. What you see here is an illustration from the Nuremberg Chronicle by Hartmann Schädel from 1493, printed in one of the first books ever printed. The development of the printing press brought about a similar change that we currently experience with the Internet and the availability of um, smart technology that allows us to access information from all over the globe. The illustration shows how the world was created. And it's interesting to note that the view is similar to what we just discussed in the context of Genesis, and uh, which also lines up with our modern cosmology, namely that there was a start of time here indicated by the fingers, the hand of God in the top left corner that initiated the creation of the world. 
The world is depicted as a closed volume. It's therefore finite. That's remarkable. Because one would have thought that everyone looking up into the sky in the 15th century would have thought this must be infinite. That's a naive impression. We still get today if we look up there, seeing all the stars. Inside this closed volume of the world, the illustrator depicts a distinction between light and darkness. In a sense, this 15th century illustration preempts our modern view of cosmology, namely that light was created and is still present as the electromagnetic background radiation that is almost uniform and corresponds to a black body spectrum at a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. In an attempt to connect a 2,500 year old piece of religious writing, Genesis 1 to 3, with one of the first illustrations ever printed by Hartmann Schädel in 1493 with our modern cosmology, it may be summarized that um, the similarities of those views of the world that are part by centuries are quite remarkable. In particular, all three illustrate, point to a definite initiated beginning of the world and not a steady state situation as it was discussed in physics before 1965. Both Genesis and also the Schedel illustration describe a volume filled with darkness and then light. And the darkness we find in our modern view as a vast emptiness of the universe, which currently has only one atom typically per cubic meter. And the fact that the modern form of the universe was preceded by the so-called dark age of the universe, where light was not decoupled from matter. The light might be a reference to what we now consider the cosmic background radiation, which is present as a black body radiator and almost uniform in all directions. And of course, the stars that illuminate our night sky. As in Genesis, our modern cosmology considers the history of the universe as an evolutionary process and not as a single event which created the entire world in one go, as it is, for example, discussed in other parts of the Bible. In our modern cosmology, energy was constant. However, in that sense, there was a steady situation. However, the volume of the universe, the space-time expanded since, has expanded since the Big Bang. And along with that, the, the temperature, the average temperature decreased. So that first particle physics, then nuclear physics, then atomic physics was possible causing the creation of nuclei and then the creation of atoms. So the history as depicted in Genesis is an evolutionary process. Our modern view of the cosmos goes beyond the simple ideas pointed to in, in Genesis. We considering a four-dimensional space-time with increasing radius and we discussing a singularity, the Big Bang, which was a point in nothing, a singularity in nothing, which since then has been expanding. The two important physics theories that describe the cosmology are the theories associated with particle physics and the theory of general relativity, which is the relativistic theory of gravitation. The combined information from these two physics theories underpins our modern understanding of the world. This view graph depicts our modern understanding of the cosmology of the universe really well. Plotted here along the horizontal axis is time, starting at the Big Bang at zero seconds and finishing on the right at 13.8 billion years, which is the current age of the universe. Not to scale are indicated important epochs of the universe. Followed by the Big Bang is the period of inflation which is the least understood aspect of our cosmology. It brings together our 
present understanding of particle physics and the cosmological observations. Unfortunately, we don't have much evidence for this period, which is, however, important to provide for a consistent history of the universe, starting with the Big Bang and finishing today. You can see, as indicated by the colors, that the energy density decreases as time increases, and along with that goes a decrease in temperature. At um, about one microsecond, the protons are formed, the first protons are formed, and those first seconds also define an era of particle physics. The physics of the universe is dominated by particle physics. Then over the first three minutes or so, nuclear physics dominates, and a period known as Big Bang nuclear synthesis occurs, where most of the hydrogen and most of the helium are formed, a little bit of lithium and beryllium, However, none of the other elements are formed during those first three minutes. They are, also f they are all formed within stars. As the temperature cools down further and the three minutes pass, we then have an important uh, time that is 380,000 years where the energy density of the universe is such that the light is not continuously scattered by free electrons anymore and it becomes decoupled from matter. This point is emphasized by the zigzag wave that then becomes a horizontal wave with decreasing wavelength just above the cone depicting the universe. What's also shown is the accelerated expansion of the universe with the cone opening up as time proceeds. This is associated with dark energy which has repulsive gravitational properties. At the very top of the view graph a possible gravitational wave is indicated that might be indicative of the inflation period and direct evidence for that really speculative era of the universe. A few years ago the first evidence of gravitational waves has been observed for uh, the collapse of a binary object and therefore it may be hoped that a similar signal might be observed that can be associated with the important inflation period right at the beginning of the development of our universe. This slide shows a similar depiction of the cosmology of our universe. In this cartoon, the important times on the vertical now are given more precisely and the history of the universe is divided into eras, starting with the Planck era, which is just the very first fraction of a second, 10 to minus 3 of a second, where we barely know anything. Then the Great Unified Theory era, up to 10 to the minus 35 seconds. That refers to particle physics, which we can describe with our modern theories of particle physics. Then an era where the electroweak interaction is decoupled from the strong interactions. We're still within particle physics. However, at about a microsecond, the energy content, the air energy content has developed such that the energy density is much less so that we now enter an era of nuclear synthesis which as uh, pointed out lasted about three minutes and hydrogen and helium were created during those three minutes most of those two uh, elements were created that's followed by about 300 380,000 years of light being strongly coupled to electrons by scattering from free electrons however then the uh, temperature, the energy density decreases sufficiently that atoms can be formed and uh, at about one billion years we have now the first galaxy forming due to gravitational collapse of matter. And uh, this era now lasts until today with stars and galaxy continuously formed so that we now at an age of 13.8 billion years. For clarity, I've depicted here 
the history of the universe once more, pointing out important aspects of that development as they will be discussed in this lecture series. On the horizontal axis there are three scales, a time scale, a temperature scale and a qualitative scale which depicts the types of physics that occur predominantly during these eras, starting with particle physics followed by nuclear physics followed by atomic physics, matter, condensed matter and then uh, cosmology and astrophysics. In this course, however, we'll focus on particle physics, nuclear physics, atomic physics and quantum mechanics as it applies to those three theories. On the Y scale, the radius of the universe is indicated as before, starting at the singularity at zero time with uh, an infinitely small diameter then rapidly increasing during inflation further expanding and then at, um, at uh, modern times experiencing an accelerated expansion that goes into the future. Important events are indicated at one microsecond the proton is formed at about 10 milliseconds Hel helium big bang nuclear synthesis occurs then we have uh, the finishing of nuclear synthesis at three minutes followed by a dark age so-called because the photons scatter permanently with three electrons using via Compton scattering and are not decoupled. However, 380,000 years the decoupling occurs and since then we have this uniform, almost uniform background radiation that can be best described with the radiation formula of a black body radiator. At this time the typical temperature of the universe, the average temperature is of the order of 10 to the 10, 10 to the 9 Kelvin and uh, decreasing further to modern days where it's less than 3 Kelvins and where we have a typical matter composition of only 5% of baryonic matter that's the protons, the helium and the 1% oxygen and the 1% rest of the atomic um, of the periodic table. However, we've also uh, got evidence for 25% of dark matter and 70% of repulsive gravitational repulsive dark energy. That's the situation of the universe today at 13.8 billion years. A couple of other important events are indicated. For example, the matter-antimatter destruction era, which happened right before the beginning of nuclear synthesis at about 10 microseconds. And since uh, we understand there was slightly more matter than antimatter, our modern universe is dominantly made out of matter. Antimatter exists and can be created. However, it almost immediately annihilates with the dominating matter and uh, both types of matter are then turned into energy according to Einstein's equivalence of energy and matter E equals mc square. Right before the inflationary period in the development of the universe, the high energy density permitted only quarks and gluons to exist and this plasma of quarks and gluons has been tested in laboratory experiments on Earth. So we have a very good handle on that era of the universe. As pointed out before, the inflationary period is still rather speculative. However, we can hope for evidence through gravitational waves from that era. The um, periods after that particle physics, nuclear physics, atomic, atomic physics are very well understood because we can simulate the situation in the laboratory and the era between the decoupling of the light at 380,000 years to today at 13.8 billion years is well observed using astrophysics. This cartoon depicts the first 300,000 years of the universe with an emphasis on the decoupling of the four fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetic force, weak force and strong force. The first decoupling occurred 
after 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang when gravity decoupled from the other three. During this era, the matter was dominated by quarks and gluons. Further decoupling then occurred when the strong force decoupled from the electroweak force, which is the combination of electromagnetic and weak force. And then those two forces decoupled during the um, era of nuclear synthesis, where protons and neutrons combined to form helium during the first three minutes. All these processes, including the matter-antimatter annihilation at 10 to minus 6 seconds, can be well described with the standard model of particle physics. This theory is accepted and describes well the interaction of fundamental particles and it has recently been confirmed through the discovery of the Higgs boson. Our modern cosmological understanding of the universe rests in particular on four pillars of evidence. The first of which is the black body spectrum of the almost uniform background radiation, which corresponds to a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. The second piece of evidence, the second pillar, is that the abundance of the um, atomic composition of the universe is uh, at 73% to 25% to 1 to 1, whereby I'm comparing hydrogen, helium, oxygen, and the rest of the periodic table. This is in very good agreement with the predictions of nuclear synthesis theory. Furthermore, a third pillar, a third piece of evidence is the observed redshift and the Hubble law, which um, describes the velocity of receding galaxies, galaxies that recede from from each other and from Earth, and um, the Hubble law and these observations are consistent and they agree with the redshift that can be determined using astrophysical spectroscopy. Finally, the Olbers paradox tells us that the sky has to be dark, which it is, when the universe is finite. That underpins the idea that indeed we had a singularity that created space-time in the Big Bang and that this finite volume of space has since been expanding. Over the last 30 years, the Big Bang theory of the universe has been extended and is now described as the gamma cold dark matter, the gamma CDM theory of the Big Bang cosmology. This has come about because astrophysical evidence shows us that the expansion of the universe is accelerating, which can be best understood through the idea that there is a continuum of dark energy that has repulsive gravitational properties and uh, is the cause of this acceleration. There is independent different evidence for the rotation speeds of galaxies not following the expectations for the expected observed matter distribution and this uh, is um, evidence for the possible existence of cold dark matter. Independent evidence of dark matter comes also from the effect of gravitational lensing which is predicted by general relativity. Now what's not known at all about dark energy and dark matter is what forms this matter actually has. It hasn't been directly observed. Neither dark energy nor dark matter have directly been observed and there is a considerable effort at the moment to achieve the direct observation of both dark energy and dark matter. Some theories of physics are really well confirmed by experimental evidence. For example, electromagnetism and quantum mechanics has been confirmed independently in so many different ways that it can really be considered an accepted true theory of the world. In contrast, the Big Bang and the Lambda CDM 
models of cosmology are that they are models they are not complete theories they still have weaknesses and there are questions about these models in order to emphasize this they are called models rather than theories i've listed here some of the weaknesses of the big bang model in particular the postulated exponential inflation between 10 to the minus 36 to 10 to the minus 32 seconds which was proposed in 1980 by Alan Guth and Andre Linder and which is known as the inflation theory of the Big Bang model has no direct experimental evidence and it only has a general consistency with the other ideas of the Big Bang model. However, there is hope that this inflation might have created gravitational waves which in future um, could be detected. However, they have not yet been detected. Another argument against the Big Bang model is that it is a closed system. However, as time has proceeded, structures have been created, nuclei, atoms, stars and galaxies, and uh, they have arisen from uniformity. And this is uh, a violation of the, possibly a violation of the second law of thermodynamics, which um, uh, suggests that entropy in general increases. However, the creation of order out of random uniformity is in contradiction with that. The extension of the Big Bang model, namely the Lambda CDM model, has uh, in particular the weakness that there is no direct evidence for dark energy. Similarly, no direct evidence has yet been found for dark matter, although several objects are proposed. In fact, some dark matter, much as massive compact halo objects have been. However, they cannot account for the amount of dark matter necessary to explain the astrophysical observations. Therefore, other objects, for example, WIMPs, so-called weakly interacting massive particles, have been proposed to exist and there are experiments underway to possibly detect them. It remains to be seen if further evidence can be accumulated to underpin our understanding of the history of our universe. It is inconceivable that this quest for the understanding of our origins will ever cease to exist since as long as humans will exist, the lookout to the sky, to the moon, to the stars will motivate the question, where did all this, where did we come from?